Thanks. So, Kelly Reese, welcome, and and thanks for thanks for joining us. So, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, just explain yourself, how your career's gone, and how you've ended up where you are now. Um, well, I started when I was nineteen, just kickboxing, and um, I, funnily enough, I broke my wrist on my first session, and then had to wait for three months to actually go back because um, I, I I really loved it. Like I knew from the start that I loved it. And wanted to go back so obviously I had to wait because I had to be cast on my arm for three months. Um, I trained for about five or six years before I had my first fight so I actually trained for quite a while before I actually had my first fight which is quite rare. Most people they fight between you know one or two years of training and and then start from there but I did have quite a big background of training before I actually started fighting. Um, So then I jumped in the ring when I was about 24 around there. I lost my first couple of fights kind of weighed up my options a bit I was like "Mm, you know I really love it but I've lost two in a row is this really for me and um I gave it another crack and that was a boxing fight I lost that too and then I went to a fight show and I saw um Daz who's my trainer who was my trainer throughout my career um he was um, having his retirement fight and there was a couple of girls fighting on that show and I was like wow I really love I really love the style of this it's it's, it's Muay Thai, whereas I was training in kickboxing and everyone's like, you have to go to this Jim Riddler's gym. You know, they're renowned for like their Muay Thai and he's such a great fighter and he's now going to be opening his own gym and stuff like that. So I, I changed over to, to Riddler's and changed over to Muay Thai and I lost my first fight with him as well. So then I was like, you know, this is, this is a go or too great. Um, but after that, um, you know, I really knuckled down on my training and he actually did say to me like on my first month, training there um you know if if you want you could be a world champion like you have got the goods for it you have got off to a rough start um and he said he got off to a rough start with his career and stuff as well and um he said you do have the goods to be a world champion if you want to um you've got the speed you've got the skill you're just like a natural athlete so i thought okay well obviously he knows what he's talking about you know this he's not respected for no reason so um, I gave it a, I gave it a good crack and um, yeah, I ended up having 60 fights. And I think within that time from being with Daz at the start to, to the end, I think I lost three fights in like 50, 54 fights or something like that. So I got off to a really rough start, but that just goes to prove um, and, and show people that the beginning doesn't have to be the, the tail of the whole thing, you know, like it's, I ended up with six world titles, intercontinental titles, Australian titles, Western Australian titles. Um, so, yeah, as I said, it, the beginning was rough, but it ended up being almost like a fairy tale, you know? That's it. It's like some, something we always like to say. We've said it a few times, Josh and I, in, in yeah. regards to play one theory. We say the same, the, the same character that starts the journey isn't the same character that ends the journey. Like along the yeah, way, exactly. like a lot, a lot of things will happen. You know, a lot of things will happen. Yeah. That sounds like that's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for me, like, and for anyone, like in the same position to have that many losses in a row, like, I mean, one of them I got really badly injured and I popped my shoulder out. So it was, I wouldn't classify it as a loss, but it actually did come across as it, it was classified as a loss. Right. Um, like it would have been easy for me to quit because yeah. I did have a rough start and, yeah. and, when those kinds of things happen, it, it is easy to stop and it is easy to quit. But I knew like something inside my belly was telling me that it was going to be okay. And when Daz actually sat me down and said, you've got the goods, you need to trust yourself and you need to trust what I'm saying. Um, I just had this feeling in my gut that it was the right thing to do. Like, so we, just, we, we don't have a gut instinct for nothing. And I, and I always say to people, if you have a gut instinct and, and it's there and you feel it, don't ignore it because it's there for a reason. Yeah. What, what do you think that is? What, what do you think that is? And yeah, and I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question about what your coach mentioned to you. But first, um, what do you think that feeling is? How is What's it so that strong? feeling? Yeah. I just think like everyone's born with, like we've born with our senses, right? So we've got our five senses, but everyone reckons we've got a sixth sense. And I think through society, that kind of stuff is dumbed down a little bit because we're busy, we've got other things going on and we have this, um, I guess like this wall up of taking yeah, like, things in. And I, and I really feel like 
I, I don't know what it actually is, like a feeling, but it's, I think it's just the universe telling you or telling your mind or your body that it's the right thing to do and to trust that intuition. It's like an intuition, right? Yeah. I think everybody's born with it. Some people listen to it. Some people feel it, whereas others, I think, just shut it off. And do you think like when your coach was talking to you and this is, this is a common thing, you see a lot of people planting seeds and then um, this happens and just, it could just be a random conversation with someone that you don't even know, let alone a coach or someone who ends up being, I'm sure, a real close friend of yours as well. But do you think when he mentioned those things to you tell, and told you that he believes you can be a world champion and you're capable of it, that it fed that, that feeling and then you, you followed it a little more? Oh yeah, definitely. Like it did give me the confidence um, when he said it because of who he was and how he was respected in the community. Um, and, and of course his um, success as a fighter as well. I knew that he wasn't just saying it just to say it, you know, like yeah. he's got a reputation to uphold himself. So he's not going to go and give me a whole lot of information or opinions that he didn't think was real. So I guess when he said that, I was, he said, I've seen a lot of girls, you know, I've trained in Thailand, I've seen girls and you do have the capability if you want to. So um, I guess he's not going to say those kinds of things and then go in and get me bashed because I'm under his name, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's good that you, you, you talk about that as well because with this whole player one mindset, it actually sort of originated from a book series that Sam and I read. It's a sci-fi sort of um, non-fiction book but they talk about uh, if you were basically life is just sort of like a simulated game and you put in your character from the start and then once you're in there they say that those gut feelings and those intuition is actually almost like you talking to yourself as an avatar mm -hmm. through the game so it's yeah. like you giving yourself hints that this is yeah. the right way this is the path this is where to go and this is what you should yeah. be doing but to ignore well, that, I think that a lot of yeah. people we're going to have those regrets later on. So I think it is very important to listen to that. Yeah. Well, I think also too, um, our judgment and stuff is very clouded by other people's opinions as well. So I think if you, if you have something that comes up and you do have a, a an in, like a gut instinct or intuition or something like that, you, you do need to sit by yourself and really listen to what your heart and your gut are saying, because they're, they're the things that are going to give you the true, um, I guess the true answers of what you really want to do as well. So if you're listening to everybody else and it's becoming chaotic in your mind and you're like, Oh, I'm just going to do this. But really that's not what you want to do inside. Then you're going to end up doing something that you don't want to do. But if you think, hang on, I'm going to block those people out and I'm going to sit with myself and ask myself and my heart and my gut, what is it that you actually want to do? You will get the answer. And that's the, that's the path that you take rather than the path that maybe everybody else is giving opinions on. And yeah, there's a great book uh, called Mastery. Josh actually, I think, recommended this one to me. And I think I might talk that about, actually. Yeah, so you know, like, it's a, they talk about this exact kind of thing. And they say, yeah. that they dissect different people who achieved mastery or some level of mastery in whatever field they pursue. And all of them followed that, that path that they knew and maybe it wasn't as clear at the start, but there was something there that they knew, look, I need it, I want to do this. Um, yeah. For some characters in the book, it was like uh, like a, a cruise, and then this person up being Charles Darwin. So it's like whatever it is that they felt, they stuck to. And at the yeah. time, sometimes it'll be easy. The right things will be in place to push you towards it. But sometimes you cop a lot of flack and a lot of uh, disagreement about whether or not this is a good area to go down. But it's up yeah. to you ultimately. Like you said, you got to sit with yourself and mm. just really think about it. And then if you really feel that that's what you should pursue because when you pursue something related to that feeling, whenever it's, whenever it's like you have four fights or four losses for your first few fights, you wouldn't keep going without that feeling. You need yeah, that. Yeah. You push through and then before you know it, at the very end, there you go, a couple of world titles. Yeah. yeah. And I sort of came, I came to that like position when I was about six, six or seven fights and um, I'd popped my shoulder out a couple of times and I was in Thailand and I was training to fight on the undercut of the contender and I did it again. I popped my shoulder out the day before I was meant to leave for Malaysia to go to, um, to fight on the undercut of this show. And um, I'd done my shoulder a couple of times and I knew it was like, okay, I'm at this point now where this is becoming a problem and it's going to affect things that are happening 
um, for my fight career um, because I obviously had to pull out of the fight. I'm at this, I'm at this crossroads now is like, what am I going to do about this shoulder? Like it has to be either fixed or it has, has to be either fixed and I continue going down this path of being a fighter or I'm going to have to stop, quit and just deal with having this shoulder for the rest of my life and just rehab it and just keep doing some exercise that's going to keep me fit and healthy. So as, as much as I was obviously not really wanting to get surgery, it was the only thing that was going to fix it. So I had to make that decision there like, okay, do we go down this way or do we go down that way? Do I want to be the champion that I have planned for myself or do I want to go the way that is probably going to be the easiest on my body, but it's not really what I want to do. So then I had to make that decision. Okay. I have to stop now for six or seven months. I have to get this surgery and then I have to go from there. So that's the path that I followed. So that's kind you of that same intuition. Like it was like, okay, my gut is telling me I need to get this surgery done because I'm not finished here. I'm not finished in this sport. I want to be a champion. So it's going to have to take, you know, X amount of months to get this thing done and fixed and then keep moving in that direction that I wanted to go in rather than just veer off and end up nowhere. <laughs> I think they had the same sort of feeling when my mine was way different, I guess, but I had a very similar occurrence when I first got diagnosed with a tumor and I didn't, I didn't know what it was at first. I was actually training for my second pro fight and rebellion. And during camp I was just running and then I was just doing some trail runs and I just realized my leg wasn't feeling all right. So then I started going to my, my physio and he was checking it out. He thought it was just a big knot to try and work it out. And you'd just be like pushing on it and just pushing on it and it kept getting bigger. And after six weeks, he's like, all right, you got to get it checked, get it yeah. checked. And then they come bursting through the doors like, hang on, you got to go to emergency, whatever. So then about a week later, just bouncing back and forth between hospitals. Um, I remember just waking up one morning, I was sitting in the waiting room for almost 13 hours. And then um, at about five or 6 a.m., he's like, yeah, you can come through. And then he's like, uh, sorry, mate, but I think you've got cancer. And I was like, whoa, hang on a sec. I thought I was just training for a fight only last week, you know, and then we started going through it. Leg? Pardon? Was it in your lower leg or your upper leg? Um, in my, in my, what do you call it? My, uh, tibia, in the head of my femur, uh, fibula, oh. sorry. So just on the left, yeah. on my left knee, the head of that fibula. So sort of just off the knee, luckily. Yeah. If it was the tibia, the top of the tibia, they would have cut my leg off for sure, no doubt. But um, I was very, very lucky. Thinking like maybe it's a bit of a like knee injury or something like that. Not yeah. Really quite for the, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I remember having that same sort of feeling when I was going through it all. And there was a lot, it took a, a big sort of four month process before we worked out, um, you know, if it was cancerous or not, or um, if I'd have to go through chemo or if I'd have to amputate my leg. And it got to the point that on Christmas day, I got surgery and I was very lucky enough to wake up with my leg still there and just, took out about six inches of my fibula. Um, yep. But other people in the same room, I mean, we're all in this, the, the sarcoma ward, so in the cancer clinic, and people yep. in the same room with me, we all went into surgery together. And I remember waking up and there was a guy across from me that lost his leg, lost both his legs. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, like that could have easily been me in that bed, you know? Perspective and yeah, and then luckily at the same time for me anyway that you were going through your own knee surgery, so I got to bounce off your energy and – it really helped a lot, which is crazy because yeah. we met, that, you know. But I thought those same thoughts with the career-wise. I thought, uh, is it, am I going to be able to fight again? And all the doctors said, no, you're not fighting. That's done for you, you know, sort of one and done sort of career. And then I thought, what am I going to be, like a 22-year-old coach? Am I going to coach Muay Thai now or what am I going to do? And I just thought, well, I guess I'll decide for myself whether I can or can't. So, I mean, yeah. I've made a few adjustments. I'll switch to Southpaw, hopefully – they don't kick my, my back leg and we'll see how we go from there, you know, but I yeah. thought I had that same sort of feeling where it was like, yeah. you know, I, I believe some, I can't prove why I can, but I think yeah. I can fight, you know, so I'm going to have a crack and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I do think that a lot of doctors can be very conservative with that kind of thing and they don't quite, do you know Joe Dispenza? He does a lot of stuff yeah. like on the mom. Yeah. He's really good at that kind of stuff, but I really feel like doctors and um, surgeons and things like that, they don't put enough emphasis on how strong the mind is and how, how much the body 
is capable of healing through the mind as well. Like they just see what they do, which is a great job, obviously. Otherwise we wouldn't be walking around like what we're doing. They do a great job, but I definitely think there's a whole nother aspect that they just completely miss. And that is the power of the mind. And um, you've just proven it to yourself. You're going to change it to Southport, et cetera, et cetera. I've just proven it to myself. They said that, you know, it's going to take over 12 months before I could like squat heavy. And, but I, I really, you trust yourself. You've got this inner trust in yourself and this belief. And um, I don't think that can be broken when you have it. Yeah, that is crazy, isn't it? I don't know what it's, – it's so hard to explain. I mean, we're very lucky to obviously have guys like Joe Dispenza coming through and, and talking about this, this sort of new neuro, neuroplasticity of your brain and trying to prove it with neuroscience, which is great. Um, if only it was more commonly accepted, I think that we try and understand it better and, and pay a bit more attention to, to our mental state more than we are any time else, you know what I mean? I mean, who knows what we could really be, be capable of. But, I mean, it's good that he's coming out now and saying something about it. It's a lot though. Yeah. A lot of it confuses me to be honest, but from the most part, I mean, I've tried reading his, um, listen to his audio book. can't remember what the name of it is actually, but, um, there's a lot of things like, especially just for the affirmations we've been pretty big on, uh, in the last few episodes as well, we've had a few different people come on and explain different ways. And that was actually something I wanted to ask you because I wrote down earlier that you were pretty big on using, um, a sports psychologist throughout your career and did a bit of hypnosis yeah. work and with the affirmations. Yeah. Yeah, so as I was just saying about my shoulder surgery um, before, once I got that surgery done, I had this when I came back and I was like, okay, I want to fight again. Obviously, let's start training for a fight. I fought within five months, but I was still really wary about my shoulder. And I was worried that I was going to do it again because, you know, so, I'd done it so many times. I ended up doing it like seven times or something prior to the surgery. And um, one of my, um, well, my boss at the time, his brother, Justin Langer, was a cricketer. And he saw this same sports psychologist and he said, he's amazing. You've got to go and see him. He'll help you get over the fear that you have going into your fights with your shoulder because it's all in your mind and everything. So from my seventh fight right up to my last fight, I saw a sports psychologist quite, quite a bit during the initial period uh, because obviously we were getting to know each other, getting to, he was getting to know my mind and I was getting, trying to learn how to use my mind. And, um, but I saw him from like my seventh fight all the way up to my 60th fight. And I, I truly believe hundred percent that he was an absolute game changer for me. Like I would, I would recommend using a sports psychologist to any athlete out there because he just really taught me how to talk to myself as well. Um, not just doing things through visualization, but how to actually talk to myself as a person and as a fighter and as an athlete outside of the ring, inside of the ring, leading up to a fight. Um, it was just amazing, really. So what sort of techniques would you go through during a session? Um, so initially, he, you know, it's so long ago how to, how to even remember how we even started to get over my shoulder. But talking about just a general fight, um, a, a general fight and a lead up to a fight, he would um, talk about how to talk to myself during training. Um, bring up certain aspects of training. So, um, for instance, um, if I was sparring somebody and they were getting the better of me, things that would go through my head, like, oh, my God, he's throwing this. I can't, I can't get around this. Okay, how are we going to change what you're talking or what you're saying to yourself so that it's in a positive way? Okay, so this guy's getting the better of me. I can't get my kick in. Okay, so, yes, he's getting the better of me. I can't get my kick in but I'm better at this. So I'm going to throw this, that kind of stuff. So just positive changing the way that you talk to yourself, um, dropping things like using the word can't and try and don't because they're very um, strong words that stand out to a person and to a person's mind. They don't drop those words. So if I was to say, I'm trying, I'm trying to land this kick is almost a negative in itself because it means I'm not landing it because I'm trying to land it. So just take out the word try and I'm going to land this kick. If it misses, it misses. It doesn't matter. But it's just, it was learning things like that as well. Like taking certain words out of my vocabulary when I was training to be more positive with the way that I was thinking. Does yeah, that right. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. So, was yeah. It awesome? <laughs> I, I, I came home and I explained a lot of this stuff to dad as a trainer because it, it helped him as a trainer as well. So rather than in the corner um, yelling out, 
don't throw this or don't throw the knee or don't throw this. We're going to take that whole sentence out and I'm going to tell him what I want him to do. So then there's no confusion or because when you say to someone, I've even witnessed this with my own kids, don't do this. The first thing they do, they do exactly what you've asked them not to do. Right? <laughs> don't throw the toy on the floor. The first thing they do is throw the toy on the floor. Don't throw the right kick. All they hear is, right, I'm going to throw the right kick. So yeah. it's just changing the vocabulary around. So um, you, you're basically doing what you want to do rather than what you're not wanting to do. So yeah, we did heaps awesome. of stuff. Yeah, it's really like interesting. A lot, a lot of, I guess everyone knows that mindset is, is a massive part of fighting. It's common knowledge, I guess, inside and yeah. outside of, of, of fighting. But it's, it's cool to see more and more, especially for, for younger fighters, like um, the, the people that I'm training with, everyone and people that are coming up through the sport. And there's so many gems being dropped from people like yourself, people like I saw Israel Adesanya went and saw a sports psychologist early. A lot of these people are uh, yeah. doing that, finding the benefit and then passing it back and, and telling people why. And you 100% can see because even the, even the little things that you might do inspiring, like for myself, I have certain little things that I've done. And when you, when you mention them, I say to myself, that's kind of the reason why. It's kind of, you just explained it to me. So like certain situations where I'll say, no. Nah, I'm going to land this. Sometimes yeah. I get annoyed in the round. I'll say, I'm going to land my, my rear teeth. I'm, I'm landing it on the next one, no matter what. And it seems to always work. Like there's a yeah. massive connection between mind and body. And if you, if you use that self-talk, I'm keen to, to learn more about this area. Like I'll probably get his, um, his details from you as well. For his, um, the show well even, I used to say to him like at the, at the start too, like, but what if, and he said, what if like, what do you mean what if and I'm like well, what if I go out there and she knocks me out and he's like you know what you've got to do with that phrase you've just got to put one word in front of it so so what if so what if she knocks you out it's not the end of the world so what yeah. if you don't land the kick it's not the end of the world do you know what I mean it just makes it feel like yeah, it's right. okay because we put so much pressure on ourselves and we ask out you know our logical brains always like what if this happens what if that happens who really cares at the end of the day? It's just, a, it's a sport. So it's just one of those things. So, so what if it happens? It's, it happens, doesn't it? It's not the end of the world. When, when you get that balance, because everyone's, in, a lot of people in martial arts are, are super competitive. So, and for whatever reason, people feel losing for certain things. Some people naturally don't, some people do. But whenever you see someone have that balance where they say like, like they love the sport so much and they're very competitive, but at the same time, they're completely okay with the idea of losing these people like Jorge Masvidal, um, like these are only MMA characters I can think of because you fight a little bit different. Like I feel, I feel like it, it's, it definitely affects you. You fight a little bit different, but more so than the fight itself, you're much calmer and you're much more okay with yourself inside and outside of the ring. It's not, you don't yeah. put everything on yourself and everything, if you put everything about yourself and your worth, based on your performance in the fight, you're forgetting that yeah. it's just a night and that, and that anything can happen. And you're going up against someone who may have put in just as much or if not more work and anything can happen. So taking a, taking a, taking a step back and saying, like, it's not that much of an issue if I do lose, so what? It's just, it's just a sport. I lost. Guess what? There's another, yeah. there's another chance to do something else. Yeah. So we did heaps of stuff like that. And um, we did a lot of stuff on, on how to – well, not even really how to talk to yourself in the ring because, you know, when you're in the ring, you have a lot of things that go through your head. And he said that that's not okay. <laughs> um, you need to have a clear mind because in the ring, you're on fight and flight, right? So you need to be, you need to be firing off basically autopilot. So you've done all the training on the pads and inspiring and everything like that. So your body knows what to do. So if you're in the ring and you're talking to yourself, like I'm going to throw this next, or, oh my God, I've just got hurt and my shin's all buckled, you know, like it's got a massive thing on it. I'm going to have to go out there and kick on it soon. Like, and he really taught me how to block that voice out and bring myself back to the present because I think it was my first world title fight. I got clipped across the nose and my nose broken in the first 30 seconds and I could see that it was all swollen and I could feel the blood and taste the blood and I was like, oh, shit, you know, it's, you know, two o'clock in the morning, it was a late show, two o'clock in the morning, I've just got my nose broken with an elbow. This is a world title. Everybody's here hanging around waiting for me. But prior to that, we'd done a lot of work on talking to myself in the ring and I had to bring myself back to the present. That's, that's okay. It's happened. It's fine. Let's get back to what's, 
really going on here and that's a fight like you've got to just ignore that voice stop asking yourself the questions it's not going to change or make anything better it's happened let's just look at the present and and get on with the actual fight so um we did a lot of stuff on that kind of stuff as well on actually bringing your mind from a past thought um to pretty much no thought like a present thought meaning you're clear you're not going to tell yourself what to do you're just going to react and that's what you need to do in a fight you need to react that's that's what you're there to do right you're reacting whether you're offensive or defensive you're reacting on something so if you're thinking and talking to yourself it means that you're not like clear in your mind so we did a lot of stuff like that as well yeah that's what's your headspace like before a fight hey what's your headspace like before a fight um I used to get pretty nervous at the beginning, like between maybe like between my, obviously my first fights to up to maybe my 15th or something. And then obviously with more experience, I learned to control that a lot better. And <clears throat> even meeting with him um, during my um, sessions before my fights, we would go through the whole day, not just the fight. So he'd wait, we, he'd put me into sort of like a, uh, like a deep sort of relaxation trancey kind of thing um where i was awake and he'd activate all my senses by talking to me so he'd activate my smell he'd say okay you're gonna wake up in the morning you're gonna have this for breakfast and this is what it smells like um you can hear the birds or you can hear your favorite music playing so he'd activate all my senses while i was under this state of relaxation and then he'd take me through the day and you know i used to get start to get nervous about lunchtime because I knew I was having my lunch and, and that was kind of like, okay, I'm having my lunch. That's like my final big meal. And then it's like fight time. So it's like, okay, I'm going to get nervous soon. <laughs> so he'd sort of, um, he'd get to lunchtime and he'd say, okay, this is where we start to get a little bit nervous. Your adrenaline's going to start to, you know, drip into your system a little bit. You start to feel a bit sluggish, but you know that that's okay because that's what happens. That's what's supposed to happen when you're about to go into a fight. So then certain things like that, I guess he was telling me and training my mind while I was under this state of relaxation that eventually, as soon as I started to feel that, I was like, oh, this is cool. This is what's supposed to happen. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to be feeling like sweaty palms and, you know, a bit of a dry mouth and all that kind of stuff. So um, it was really interesting and super helpful to, um, to go through all that kind of stuff. And then he'd head towards the fight. Okay. You're going, you're going to drive to the, you're going to drive to the, venue you're gonna put your favorite song on that's the song that you're walking out to so i'd listen to that get to the venue you're gonna look at the ring you're gonna go around you're gonna go and speak to everybody you know you're gonna look around you you're gonna see what's like in different parts of the venue so it doesn't catch your eye during fight so if there's like a, i don't know like a scoreboard up there that's on or something like that you're gonna see all this kind of stuff and you're gonna take it all in and so when you get into the ring that kind of stuff's not gonna it's not going to distract you from what you're meant to be doing. Then you're going to get your hands wrapped. You're going to smell your liniment go on your body. That's another thing that makes you nervous, right? So you've got the liniment going on your body. Um, this is where you're going to start to feel heavy. This is where you're going to start to feel nervous. And um, then obviously you're going to be hitting pads and then you're going to walk out. When you walk out, this is where you're feeling clear. You've got nothing in your mind. You've got no thoughts, you're not angry, you're not nervous, you're not upset, you're just going in there and you're going get, to get the job done. And that's exactly how I felt every fight, like exactly how he would describe what happened when I was in that uh, state of relaxation is exactly what happened every time. So I'd go there, I'd do my remote, I'd be looking around, making sure that nothing was going to distract me. I'd see, I'd look out into the crowd, yep, there's my mum, she was always in the same spot. I'd see that person, yeah, give them the nod. So those people wouldn't catch my eye like during a fight, you know. I just I didn't see any of those people as soon as the bell went. So you're just trying to familiarize yourself so that nothing yeah. requires, nothing's a shock when on the day. Yeah. Yeah. So nothing's a shock. It's pretty yeah. interesting stuff. Because you, you see people in the ring sometimes and they're looking around and like, hey, what the fuck yeah. are you looking at? You've got someone there that wants to knock your head off. Like, <laughs> Yeah, true. You yeah. see that a lot, especially with jiu-jitsu. You see a lot of guys looking at the scoreboard, looking at the clock, and it's like, yeah, look at the clock. Help you. you can see people too. Like, I can I see it all the time because I sit ringside a lot um, for commentating, so I can see it happen. Like, you can see two fighters. It could be, like, quite even, 
and then someone starts to get the better of someone else and you can just see that person's mind you can just see it slipping slipping and then you can just see the fighters start to separate like that because that person's mind regardless of how good they are because they've been able to maintain and keep up with this fighter regardless of how good they are their mind is taking them down here and they're thinking oh this person's getting the better of me that person starts to rise that person starts to fall and then it's just a yeah, that's a landslide then. A real division. Yeah, right. So do you do you recommend any of your own fighters to do this sort of stuff as well? Um, yeah, a lot of our fighters have gone to see sports psychologists. Probably, yeah. uh, I don't think many of them have seen the same one I saw because I think he might be retired. But yeah, they've definitely gone to see like hypnotists and stuff like that. That's crazy because my first ever, my debut fight would have been maybe three years ago now. And I was um, when Barry Oliver was headlining the show down in Melbourne at um, St. Kilda Town. Oh, no, not St. Kilda Town. Somewhere in St. Kilda. <laughs> Barry Oliver was headlining one of the um, size shows. And yeah, I I'm just trying to think. Who's he was versus Ramesh. Ramesh, oh, yeah. I think yeah. I was there, actually. Uh, Daz was definitely there. I seen him in the corner. I don't remember seeing you, though. Yeah. But I remember being in the same – I was in the same – I think we were in Blue Corner or whatever it was. But I remember watching Barry and – I was getting ready. Obviously, I was fighting earlier on and I'm warming up, getting, doing my thing. And I'm looking at Barry and Barry's just lying on the floor, just chilling out. And I was like, yeah. how is he that relaxed? And I'm like, wait, yeah. how am I, am I supposed to be this nervous? And I was like, wait, what's going on here? But he just came out calm as ever, just chilled the whole, he's fault. He, this, the whole fight, I don't think his facial expression changed. And I was yeah. like, this guy's in the zone. So I was yeah, really impressed by seeing that. Yeah. And a lot of that, um, a lot of that comes down to the people that you surround yourself with too. I think, like, when you look at our team and and look at Daz, everybody's very similar in the way that they approach their training and they approach uh, a fight. Because Daz is really, he's quite a calm and relaxed person. Like, if you ever hear him in in the corner, he never yells instructions. He talks. So his his voice just bounces off the canvas. It's it's so clear. And I feel like people listen to people that talk. They don't listen to people that yell. When someone's yelling at you, like if you're in an argument with someone, right, they're yelling at you, it kind of just, it's just this big muddle of noise. It just kind of goes in your ear and over the top of your head. But if you've got someone that sits down and talks to you and tells you, okay, this is what you're doing or this is what's happening, you have more of a chance of hearing that than you do over the person yelling. So it's the same in the corner. If someone's going to be yelling at me, there's, there's no way that that's going to be going in my head. I'm going to be like, this person's making me feel frantic, you know, like I can't, I can't concentrate rather than Kaylee. I, I need you to, I need you to pick up the pace now. I need you to throw your left kick. I need you to throw your teeth because she's getting in, you know, so that it's clear. It's, it's direct and it's, it's just a clear message. Yeah. This is very important. It's no surprise that you guys have so much success there. Like I think everyone should think everyone that fights, should definitely think and probably has how how can i improve not only my skills how can i improve the corner time i have because i say it all the time and i i hear it um i, I got good advice from my first coach and a mentor of mine now good friend of both of josh and i named uh, troy skidmore and yeah. early on in my first uh, amateur mma fight i remember him i remember i, I had to lie I, I was laying down just before my fight just before i'm walking out the last fight still the next fight still going on and, and he just walk me through somewhat of a guided meditation. And that's something I've kept with me throughout all my fighting. And I think about it all the time. And I also think about that, that 60 seconds. I train for that 60 seconds. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people at my gym do, do as well now. We, in between rounds, that 60 seconds isn't to really mess about too much. It's, there's a routine here, focus and go through your routine. Get as much recovery as you can in. Be receptive. So whatever instructions come your way, you can straight away go out there and, and perform. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, that's what Daz is like in the corner too. Like he does pretty much the same thing with every fighter. Like you walk back to the corner. He doesn't say anything for maybe the first 15 or 20 seconds. He just loosens his shorts, gets the water, sits down. So you can just take a moment for yourself, you know, like rather, rather than have all this, you know, not stuff bombarded at you. you. You just come out from, you know, having a fight. You want to be clear headed. He loosens your shorts, sits you down, sprays your mouth. I can't even remember it now. I haven't fought for five years. Um, puts a bit of water in your mouth, takes out your mouth guard, and then he'll sit in front of you directly. So you, you can't you can't look around because he's right in front of your face and he looks you in the eye and says, okay, this is what we're going to do. And that's exactly how he does it. Like he doesn't go, 
when you get out there, you've just got to smash him. You've just got to throw this. It's like, that does not work. You know, it doesn't work. You have got to be direct and, and look into their eyes and tell them what you want to do. I need you to go out there and do this. This person is doing this and this is how we're going to counter it. This is what's going to happen rather than, you know, that, I guess, a bit more of a full on approach. Yeah. Some, um, some people like it, but personally at Riddler's, we've never, we've never done that. So, and I think like our results kind of speak for themselves. Like it, it works and it's not going to be changing. <laughs> Good, good. I'm, I'm really interested in that approach because it's not so much when you're saying that and how you have to be direct, give it a very clear message, don't overword it, just say it how it is. I'm really interested in um, the way that it applies to everything because, I mean, it's, it's bigger than fighting. And obviously, um, especially with your life as well, it's, it's very dynamic at the moment. And I'm just wondering how that same sort of mindset starts to apply to everything, to be yeah. precise, thought out, and no bullshit around it. Just do it the way it is. And how can, can you go through what it's like going through your life with that sort of mindset? Well, I think I'm just like, I like to keep things simple. I'm not a, I'm not an overly complicated person. If you complicate things for me, my mind, my mind just goes in too many different directions. I need things to be just simple. Like what we were saying before, I don't have an iPad. I, I, this is the first time I've used Zoom. It's complicated, right? So I like to keep things simple. Um, and I'm the same with the kids. Like I like to keep things simple for them. When I have a message that I need to tell one of them, I keep it direct. Um, I don't want you to do this because this is what's happening. I'd rather you do this because when you do this, then you're doing this. So I like to try and keep my direction, I guess, the same as what does did for me in the ring. Um, you, and with, yeah, you go. Uh, I was just gonna say, this is a complete off topic of that one. Do you use any affirmations yourself? Um, I do, like I, I don't, I wouldn't say like I sit down and I journal or anything like that. And I wouldn't stand in front of the mirror and, and talk to myself and say, I am XML, or I am rah, rah, rah but I just have this inner self belief. Like I, I just believe that what I'm doing is right. And um, I just have that, you know, that positive, I guess, I guess that positive gut instinct about what I'm doing is right. Sure, but I, awesome. I wouldn't say I, I write things down and I'm not like, I am this today or I am that today. I, I tackle every day. I tackle every day differently. I mean, I've got so many different things going on that I just, I just get it done. I try yeah, not to like complicate things, you know. I've got this to do yeah. and I'm going to do it. I need to train. I've got an hour to train. This is what I'm going to do in the session. And I break it all down. The first 10 minutes of strength. The next 10 minutes, I'm going to smash out this little workout here. Then I'm going to do my rehab. And even even now, we're like even now, even just in, a, in an hour, I still have a board in my garage and I put warm-up, strength and I put what I'm doing, even though I know I'm doing it in my own head, I still write it down. And then I have my workout and then I have my rehab stretches. So when I do it, I tick it off and I cross it off, tick it off, cross it off, tick it off, cross it off. And I guess I've always been that kind of person um, with my goals because I know that when I see my goals and I have them written down, they become real, right? They become real. They're not just in your head and going around in your head. When I was fighting, I had um, at the beginning, I had a list of girls, girls names that I had to beat to get to where I needed to get. So I was like, okay, I need to beat this girl and then I can fight for a state title and I need to beat these five girls and then I can fight for an Australian title. And I'd cross the names off when I'd beaten them and fought them. I just crossed them off and I had them in a book. And then, and then you know, I need to fight this person. I need to defend this title to then fight for the world title, cross that off. I need to defend that again, cross it off. And that's just how I've been in my life where when I do something, I write it down and I just cross it off. So I, I still do, do that today, every day with my training, even though I know what I'm going to do, I still write it down and cross it off. That's kind of like affirmations because it's, it's still like actualized. Yeah. It's a good habit to, to employ. And it's one where you're actualizing a thought onto pen and paper. And even if it's yeah. just writing down the goal, you're constantly reminding yourself what that goal is. It's real. And now you can start working towards it consciously, subconsciously. Yeah. That, that's a massive thing. And yeah. especially that you get to cross it off straight away. You get that instant I satisfaction. Off. I love it. I love, I love <laughs> just getting the pen and just having, getting the texture off and just going, I feel so <laughs> 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 
Can, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the other roles you have, I guess, outside of fighting? A lot of people maybe may just hear about the fighting, but you're involved in a lot of other things. You're, you're a mom as well. Can you just, I guess, talk about those other, other roles? Um, so as well as being the fighter that I was, um, I'm now a mum of two. And that happened, like, fairly quickly. And it, it's been... Oh, man, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's been a very, very, very strange four or five years since I've stopped fighting because I went from being uh, the champion of my, of my sport in the world um, and, and defended it quite a few times to then all of a sudden I'm a mum, not only a mum of one, I'm a mum of two boys and they're, you know, under three. At the time they were under three, two under three. And then they were both depending on me. So I, I, I went from being pretty much, you'd, I'd call myself selfish being a fighter because it was all about what I was doing and, you know, what I was eating and my recovery and my training. And, you know, it's, it's a selfish sport. So I would call myself selfish. I will own that. <laughs> um, I went from being a selfish fighter to then having to be the most unselfish person with two people depending on everything that I did, every decision I made. Every, from the time they woke up, everything was all about me providing for them. Um, so it has been a very tough, I guess, four or five years with me transitioning from that to that because you feel like I felt so accomplished as a fighter doing things for myself. But as a mum, you don't see yourself accomplishing much because it's the same thing every day. It's really hard to explain. I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying, but um, so transitioning from being an athlete to a mum of two has been very difficult. And I guess taking that competition away from me as well and not being able to compete and, and fight, my life has dramatically changed. Daz's is still, I mean, he's, he's got the addition of two beautiful kids, but his life still stays the same. He's at the gym every night with the fighters and he still has that interaction, whereas I've made the decision to be at home with the boys every night. So I don't get that interaction with the fighters. I don't get to train with the fighters or anything like that. So my life has changed quite a bit. So just that transition from being a fighter and being so, so involved in something like where my, basically my heart and soul was just so like involved and <clears throat> in that, in that game to then taking it away from that and being, okay, I have to take that out of there and now put it into here was a massive change for me and I've only literally just in the last like maybe two or three weeks come to terms with that that's how long it's taken for me to actually go you know what Kaylee life is a little bit more about fighting and training and competing but because I've done that since I was five years old I've always been involved in sport so I, I've known nothing else that's that's I wouldn't say that's who I was because it's just it was a big part of who I was but to take that away from me or to not have it there and then go, this is what you're doing now. It has been like a massive, massive change. Oh, that, that's like a, I'm not saying it's a bad change. I'm just saying it's a massive change. It was yeah. a huge change. Yeah, it's good. And then um, I like right into my CrossFit and doing really well yeah. with that. Like I, I did the CrossFit Open last year and was coming like six in the world in my division. And then in the second workout, like I had a little tiny niggle in my ankle and it was hurting for a couple of weeks. I thought, oh, it's probably just, you know, as a fighter, you just, you just keep going. It's probably just a niggle. I would hurt myself. <laughs> and then it was really getting sore in the workout and I had skipping like double unders and I was like do doing my double unders. And my ankle's like not good. Hey, I can't put any weight on it. So then I was shifting on my weight to my other side and then blew my knee out. And then just having that, like I was doing so well and then just had that ripped out from underneath me after having a cesarean with Leo got right back up to full fitness and then just having that ripped underneath me. And I was thinking to myself, you know, having that, just that faith, you know, like I was going to get my MRI. I was like, maybe it's just like a little, you know, clean up or something like that. And they were like, no, nah, you've just fully blown it out. I was like, fuck, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of those. But then you that's know, true. Just, and then it's like, I've just had two cesareans in a row. I had neck surgery and I was just, you know, just getting back there and I was there. And then it just, pulled away from me again i was just like here we are again <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's so lucky that obviously you've gone through maybe even being a fighter and having that mindset to be able to apply it to these different phases of life because 
without yeah. that, I mean, it's a much bigger struggle. It drags out longer. It affects those around you. But it's been really interesting to, to watch that journey. I think it was probably more about, uh, around that same time that we both had the surgery that I started to follow it. And then, so I, I seen when that happened and I was like, whoa. But I was very interested in probably in a selfish way to watch how you were going to bounce back. Because I knew it was going to happen. I'm like, oh, shit, she's going to do it. She's going to do it. And it was just crazy because I'm like, man, this is, there was nothing sugar-coated about it. It's real. It sucks most days. It's hard. And I was like, hang on a minute. She's not just, you know, this world champion. That just, there was like a, a bit of a myth in a way. But it was like, hang on, she's a real person. She actually does yeah. these things. She struggles. And she's pretty happy to, to put it all out there. And it's, it's yeah. very exciting to watch. Yeah. Well, I feel like with social media, it's like it, it has its, it has its really good points and then it has its really shit points. And I promised myself from the beginning using Instagram, I don't use any other, like I've deleted my Facebook and that, but I really felt like if I'm going to do something on social media and, and let people see this version of myself, I have to give the true version of myself. I can't just be putting up like fake stuff and pretending that I'm doing this and I'm not doing that, you know, like I'll, I'll, I will give people my my honest opinion or my honest true self. Like if I feel shit and I feel like people can gain something from what I'm about to say about why I feel shit, then I'll put it up and I'll, and I'll write why I'm feeling shit and what I'm going to do about it and tell people that it's okay. And, you know, we all have days like that and, or even times like that, you know, like after I did my knee, I think maybe for, you know, 10 days to two weeks, I was, I was a miserable sack of shit, to be honest. Like, I didn't really, I didn't engage with the kids. I didn't like, I ate a lot of shit food, but I really feel like I had to put that out there and tell people that that's okay. Like I'm grieving. Like I've had a massive thing taken away from me and for the next, you know, X amount of months, my life is going to be, you know, really freaking hard. Like I've got a two story house with two kids under three. I'm not going to be able to walk. I can't drive. I can't do my job properly. So, you know, I felt like that was an important thing to put out there and tell people that, I'm not okay. I'm not feeling okay right now. And that is okay because it's going to pass. It's grief. And, and, and I'm allowed to feel that. I don't have to pretend that I'm, I'm good all the time. Like I am a strong minded person, but I have my shit days. Like I have my weak moments and, you know, people need to see that even though I was a world champion, man, I can, I can have my days where I feel like I'm not a world champion at all. Yeah. That's crazy. Cause everything that I'm, I'm hearing right there, is um, obviously it's real, but the biggest thing that sort of jumps out at me is how self-aware you seem with everything that's going on around you. So for, mm-hmm. for one, to be able to say that the minute you do your knee, it's like, hang on, this is it's a real thing. It's going to infect me in this area of my life and that, and to just, just accept everything that's happening in real time and then start to think about the ways that you can deal with it. Because for, for example, labeling your own grief, just to realize, hang on, it's just grief this is what it is, this is what it does, and this is how yeah. I can move forward. How do you think that you became so self-aware like that? Um, I think probably if I think about it, which I haven't really actually even thought about it, probably working through with the sports psychologist, to be honest, like just um, learning about myself and learning about my feelings and how I feel in certain situations. And I've read lots of books on stuff and that kind of stuff as well, I think, and I guess you just learn, like, when, when you're involved in a sport at such a high level, you, you do become, it's, it's a lot about yourself. So you have to learn about yourself too. It's not just like going every day to training and hitting the bag and coming home. It's like people want to beat me. People want to, like, there's people out there that want to see me lose. There's people out there that want to see me succeed. I have to learn about myself. I have to learn about how to deal with certain situations. I have to learn how to deal with certain people. I have to learn how to deal with myself. What happens if these people say these things to me? How is that going to make me feel? What happens if this happens to me? How is that going to make me feel? I'm allowed to feel like that. That's okay. And we're just, just really learning about yourself and, and going back to that intuition. If, if you feel that's what you want to feel, then, and that's your gut feeling, then let yourself feel it. Simple. I like that. Simple. That's not. But a lot of people, like, when I did my knee, they were like, oh, you'll be right. You'll be, you'll bounce back. And like a couple of people said that to me. I was like, you know what? I'm not feeling okay right now. Like I don't, I don't need you to tell me I'm going to bounce back because I might not like, and that's okay. But like, just, just let me, just let me be, just let me feel like shit for a while. Like, 
my yeah. life, not my life, but a big part of my life has just been pulled out that I've worked so hard for, for nine months, has just been ripped out from underneath me. Not only that, now I'm going to have to have a whole year ahead of me of, you know, rehab and stuff like that. I can't look after my kids. You know, I had a kid, a child under one. And, you know, like I just, I just felt like I was in just a shit place for a while, you know, and, and that's anyone, okay. I think anyone that listens to this will definitely be able to tell that you're super strong because just, just imagining the challenges that would come with injury, let alone change. Anytime there's massive changes, there's going to be some, some massive challenges. The changes aren't yeah. easy for the mind to go through. And for you, you went through a complete, a complete, um, a complete, a complete flip from being, like you said, as a world champion, you have to be very selfish and you have to focus a lot on yourself. And the benefit is you learn a lot about yourself, but you went from that to the complete, it was a complete role reversal. So I know that I can just imagine like the challenges would have been gigantic, but for you to have come through them, you can tell from, I guess, the way you carry yourself that you, you've built a, a very, uh, very good skill set of, of managing and processing these, these times. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome to see. Yeah. Well, I guess having two, not two, I've had like, well, I had both my shoulders done and my neck surgery. Um, I guess having those couple of surgeries behind me helped a little bit as well because I, I was aware of what was needed to be done. Like, okay, yep, I've injured myself. Let's feel like shit and eat all the ice cream and chocolate there is in the whole world for the next 10 days. And then after that let's get your shit together and let's, let's tackle what's in front of us. So I, I did have like a little bit of, I guess, training, <laughs> knowledge, yeah. knowledge on how to sort of tackle that situation. Um, but it was just, it was just different with the kids, you know, like I, you know, my kids used to come to me. They weren't coming to me because they knew I couldn't pick them up. They knew I couldn't put them to bed. They knew I couldn't feed them and stuff like that. So that in itself, seeing my, my two children that I was bringing up and then I was super close to go to somebody else for help. That was hard, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. Like, okay, let's, I, I need to get better. I need to follow this rehab and I need, I need to get better for my kids. That like, it was always, I need to get better for myself, but I need to get better for myself. And I've got these two people that I want to be able to kick the football with in a couple of months. And I want to be able to wrestle with them and play with and stuff like that. So, um, I guess having them there was was a big motivator for me as well. Yeah, the ultimate mo motivator. Um, yeah. This is good. And kids is the ultimate motivator, right? If you can't change change your mindset or change your ways for your children, then you know your kids. Your kids are good. Exactly, and it's just a, just to sort of come to the end. How what would be the so obviously you've had such a, a crazy, crazy career and a crazy life, um, a lot of downfalls and a lot of ups, but what, from all, everything that you've gone through and everything you've learned, what do you think that, that one piece of advice that you could carry on to others would be? Mm, the one piece of advice is trust yourself. Trust yourself. Because you can have all the doctors, all the whoever tell you a bunch of certain stuff, that's a general, for, a, for, for the general population, right? They said to me, you're not going to be able to do this within X amount of time. That's, that's a general idea for the general population. But everybody is different. Everybody responds differently. Everybody has a different mentality. Everybody has a different way of uh, living with their diet and, and food and nutrition and everything like that. And that all plays into the final product. So I could have had exactly the same surgery as Joe Bloggs next to me here, but he's eating McDonald's and, you know, not doing his rehab. Of course, he's going to be behind me, but I've trusted myself and I've done all the right things. I, I, trust, my, I trust my ability to, to have good sleep, to eat properly, to do the proper rehab. And that's, that's why I might not be in front of him but I'm ahead of him because I've done the right things and I've trusted myself. I think, um, you know, a lot of people have said to me, like I've even said, even Daz said it to me the other week. He was like, I said, Oh, I just, I just back squatted 95. And he goes, yeah, but you're you. And I was like, yeah, but 
maybe everybody can do that if they apply themselves to do the correct thing. Maybe it's not because I'm me. Maybe it's because I'm just doing the right thing and those other people aren't doing the right thing. Do you know what I mean? Exactly, yeah. It's still human. Everyone has the same choice. It's whether you decide to to go that way or whether you decide to go that way. And if you trust yourself and you're like, I'm going to trust myself and I'm, I'm going to do this 60 kilo squat because for the past three months, I've been doing the right rehab for it. So I deserve to try this and I'm going to trust myself and I'm going to do it. That's why I got that 60 kilo squat. Whereas Joe Bloggs here, he hasn't been doing his rehab. He's been eating McDonald's. He can't squat 20 kilos because he hasn't been doing the work for it, you know? Exactly. So <laughs> go back, yeah, yourself. Go back yourself. Go back yourself. Go back yourself. Go back yourself. And, and, and like what I was saying at the beginning, you've got to own it. Like if you're, like if you're um, not seeing results, then ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? Like, why aren't I getting these results? I'm training so hard from Monday to Friday, but every weekend I'm going out on the piss with my friends, which leaves me feeling like kind of death on Monday and Tuesday, but I'm still training. If you're not seeing results, you have to change something in your life to, to see results or to make, to make some changes. You know, like if you're you're eating like three. Go on. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I was going to say, if you're eating like three servings of takeaway, takeaway meals a week, but you're training hard and you're just not quite seeing those bottom two abs that you want to see, maybe it's the three takeaway meals you're eating. <laughs> yeah, simple. And eat some something proper, like proper food, you know? Exactly, no, yeah. Then there's a good quote by Guy Ritchie that we've posted before. Um, Guy Ritchie made a bunch of great movies. You'd love them, especially if you think about things in that kind of uh, mentality. But his quote is, a lot of people say, don't hate the player, hate, hate the game. He said, yeah. don't hate the game, love the game, accept the rules and move into the rules. And another yeah. thing he also says is, you, you have to own the suit. So exactly like you're talking about, you, you really got to own it. And the whole thing about accepting the rules and moving into the rules, like you said, one person could not have done any rehab, been eating shit. But if you look at the rules, the rules are simple. You do your rehab, you have a good diet, you supplement yourself with what you need to supplement yourself with, accept the rules, move into the rules, and then you can begin to reap the rewards of the game. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And too many people are quick to make excuses and, and stuff like that. And it's, it's, it's like, I don't have, you know, like I'm the last person to give excuses oh. to. I've been through much shit. I'm like, I, I can't get to training because I've hurt my finger. I'm like, you've got another arm. You've got two legs. It's just so much you can work around, you know, like, Don't make excuses. If you have a reason, I I understand a reason. A reason and an excuse are different things, right? You need to understand the difference between having an excuse and having a reason. I can't run because I'm nine months pregnant. Okay, that's a reason. That's not an excuse. You have a reason there. Or I can't run because I've hurt my finger. No, mate, that's an excuse. That's the difference. What people need to realise is there's a difference between those two things. And, you know, everyone has the choice. And at the end of the day... Whatever you choose is your choice. Yeah. If you exactly. choose to person and you choose to eat that and and miss training for a week, then you've chosen that. That's that's your choice. Yeah. And exactly. that's why that's why you're not getting the benefits or or you know, from from what or, or what you want, you know? Yeah, and you just need to be a little bit more I guess people just have to be a bit more self aware about what it is that they, they really want. I mean, be realistic. If your goal is to be a world champion fighter, obviously there's some pretty strict rules and guidelines for the best ways to approach that. And if, if it's not, if you're just trying to have some fun and, and just rock up to training and maybe have a few fights, whatever it is, then yeah, I guess that's, that's the path for you. That's your choice. Yeah. And I think something with goals too, I think people, they do have goals. Sometimes they might be a little bit too big in terms of like they're, they're trying to think too far ahead instead of just thinking like little steps. You can have a big picture goal, I guess, like an end an end goal. But I think it's important to remember that to get to that end goal, there are so many little different steps and little little goals that you need to, to get through first to get to that end goal. Um, and I think people focus too much on the end goal, on the end result, and it seems so unattainable if you just focus on those little small steps on the way, then they're much more attainable and and you'll see more results. And that's where I think people get a little bit lost is they're not seeing results quick enough. So then they fall off the wagon rather than just 
you know, let's just get, you want to lose 10 kilos? Cool. Let's just get that first kilo off. Let's get the first kilo off. Don't worry about the 10 kilos. That's the bigger picture. We'll think about that later. Let's just get this first kilo off and then go from there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I love that. That's the same sort of analogy, analogy you were using before when you were saying how you were sort of um, plotting your career against trying to get yeah. your state tile and, and just mapping it out from there. Yeah. That's a good, it's a good framework. Exactly. Just, just keep this, keep the goals small, keep them attainable. And it also makes you feel like you're accomplishing things often, you know, rather than, you know, I'm going to, this is my first fight and I'm going to be a world champion. That's years down the track, you know, that that's, you can fall off the wagon how many times between now and five years. Whereas, okay, I want to be a world champion. What do I know? To, what do I need to do to get there? I need to fight these people, then get this title and these people then get that title. And because there's so many different little steps along the way, you feel like you're achieving a lot because there's so many steps that you have to get through to get to the top. Exactly. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you, you can realize that. And again, I, I don't want to take too much time. I'm pretty happy with, um, with the way things have gone and, and, and everything you've bestowed upon us so far. I don't know what's happened to Sam. He's dropped out somewhere, but um, is there, is there any sort of pit, uh, parting piece of advice that you'd like to give any pointers, any tips? Um, I wouldn't say it's a tip, but I think definitely with what I've gone through lately, like with my knee, I know, I, know it's, I know it was a bad thing for me at the time and I said that I felt like my world was crashing down and everything, but I really feel like we have to remember that things can be so much worse as well and that we should be thankful for, we should be thankful for our bodies and treat our bodies with respect and... Um, as you can guess, both died. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. You're back. Yeah. Treat, our body, back. treat our bodies with respect and, and just... Keep that little keep that little thought in our head that it can always be that little bit worse, you know. Like like you said before with your leg, with your tumor, you woke up and you, your leg was still there. You know, you could have woken up and you could have been without your leg, right? So we should always be thankful for what we have. I'm super thankful. My knee will probably never feel the same again, but I have a knee that is functioning and I have a knee that I can play around with my kids and and I'm I'm so thankful for that, you know. Like I'm really appreciative of my body and and what it can do and my mind and everything. And I think we really need to, I guess what we were saying before, just, just be aware of, of how lucky we are as people and, and how good and how well our bodies heal on their own as well. Yeah. Just exactly. be thankful for what, what we have, you know, like it just could have been so much worse for you. It could have been worse for me. You know, I see sometimes I have this, I wouldn't call it a fear, but I have this, guilty feeling when I, when I run past somebody in a wheelchair or something like that, I'm like, Fuck, man, like I'm running and this poor person's in a wheelchair, you know, it could be so much worse. And I always think to myself, I'm, I'm really thankful and, and lucky that I have such a good, strong, healthy body and I'm healthy mind. And I'm just thankful for, for what I have, you know, exactly. and I think we, we all need to remember that and we all need to appreciate our bodies. Yeah. It's a, it's a crazy little journey when, when you say that, because I remember, and I guess we probably went through the same sort of thought pattern when it first hits you and you think about all the things you're going to miss out on and how hard things are going to be. But you also get a sort of sense of relief once you realize that you're going to keep your leg for one and you're like, hang on, this is, this is cool. Like I, I've, I'm still alive. I'm still going. I can still do yeah. this. And my goals and my vision may have been a bit short-sighted. I may have been thinking about the next six months, but my, the rest of my life is going to be okay, hopefully, you know. Yeah but because of this, this moment and it's too easy to get caught up in that small, small yeah. vision. Once you start to expand it and accept things, I think you're going to find yourself a bit more happier. Yeah, exactly. I think people dwell on, dwell on the little things a bit too much and they be, start to become big things. You know, they start to take little, little bits of, I guess, negative parts of their life and they all start to like join together and they start to, you know, it starts to expand. Whereas really, taking that little tiny problem there. Is it really that bad? Probably not, but I don't know. I'm just that kind of person though. I, I try not to take things to heart too much. And the mantra to myself is just, just get on with it. Like, <laughs> I'm going to write that one down. Just get on with it. Honestly, that's a big key. I've said it in so many different, um, in so many different situations too. Like with my rehab, just, just do your rehab. Just get on with it. Just train. You've got an hour. Get on with it. Like it's. I've said it to myself so many times. That's a good one. Yeah. 
So there you go. Hopefully that provided you with some little um, insightful tips. Yeah, it did. Well, definitely. It's definitely helped us. And um, obviously we're, we're very grateful that you, you took, you went out on a limb and, you know, obviously you didn't know us beforehand. So we're, we're very grateful that you decided to jump on anyway. Um, but if there is anything <laughs> ever in the future or now or whenever that you need from us or you would like from us, don't hesitate to, to reach out. We're, we're always here. Um, yeah. And we hope that we can repay the favor one day soon. Oh, that's cool. No worries. Thanks for having me on. No worries. It was our pleasure. Well, I'm like used to technology, so I've got no idea how to end this. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. We'll finish it up. We'll do the, the editing behind it. Um, all we have to do is just, is just quick it off from there, but that's pretty much it. That was awesome. I really enjoyed talking about that kind of stuff. It's, it's something that I find like really important and I feel like people need to, I guess, ad- adapt into their lives is that whole mental mindset kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. I think you've done a great job, um, especially over this, this last hour. I mean, I hope other people will start to see it and understand it for themselves and they only have to apply one of these things and I'm sure they're going to live a better life after this. Yeah. Cool. Right. Thank you. Hopefully we taught you a little bit about Zoom and hopefully that you can, you can do this again. I'm going to do now. <laughs> but cool. no, that was awesome. That was good. Um, All right, then. From there. But that was beautiful. It was good to talk to you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. No worries. See you yeah. later. Enjoy. I guess I press leave, right? I press leave. That's all good. I'll end it. <laughs> You're right. Okay. Yeah. All right. See you.